Hi everybody, welcome back. Glad you could tune in again. So we've been looking through the book of Ruth and identifying some of the character traits that we ought to be striving for if we want to be godly men or godly women. And we've noted a few of these, haven't we, in recent days. We've seen Ruth's absolute commitment to the Lord and, of course, the corollary of that to her mother-in-law, Naomi. We've seen her refusal to be a victim, even in terrible circumstances. And we've seen her deep gratitude to Boaz when he showed kindness to her. And of course, we saw Boaz's kindness that prompted that gratitude. And we also saw the way in which he had clearly lived such a life of integrity that he'd shaped not just his own life, but the lives of the men around him. And of course, just in the previous devotion, chapter three, we saw when they came together in circumstances with all kinds of dark shadows and question marks over them in the minds of many. Nonetheless, in their minds, there was absolute propriety in all that they were thinking and all that they said, and all that they did. Remarkable scene in chapter 3. But there's one more. There is one more character trait, which is displayed by Boaz. And this is a character trait which I'm afraid in Christian circles is very widely neglected. Largely because people don't even realise it's something we ought to be striving for. I'm talking about shrewdness. Boaz, the older, wiser, godly man from Bethlehem, is shrewd and he shows us how to be shrewd also. Shrewdness we might describe as the ability to deal with life in an ungodly world when you're surrounded by ungodly people whose motives might not always be 100% pure and to deal with those circumstances in such a way that you're able to protect those whom you're responsible for. In this case, of course, he wants to protect Ruth. And we know why, because in chapter three, um, he committed himself to marry her, to redeem her. But that needs to be settled in court, and it turns out that there's a complication. And the complication and Boaz's solution uh, emerge in chapter 4, along with the shrewdness by which he accomplishes it. Let me walk you through the text and just highlight a few things for you. Now, Boaz had gone up to the gate and sat down there. Now, that's interesting already, because the gate was the place where the elders of the land sat. Uh, Proverbs 31, uh, the husband of the godly woman in the, in the final chapter of Proverbs, is known among the elders where he sits at the gate is a court, in other words, it's where legal hearings take place because there's no point in going to all the effort of getting the guy to agree to let you marry Ruth if it's going to be then um, challenged later because there were no witnesses to hear it. So that's <laughs> that's what goes on in verse 1, then verse 1 again, and behold the Redeemer of whom Boaz had spoken came by in God's good providence. So Boaz said, turn aside friend and sit down here. Friend, you see, there's no need to antagonise people. I think sometimes people imagine that if you want to try and uh, shape a situation, the way to do it is to be forceful and aggressive. Well, a gentle answer turns aside wrath, according to the book of Proverbs. And clearly that's uh, an instinct which has found its way into Boaz's heart as well. And he turned aside and sat down and he took ten men of the elders of the city and said, sit down here. So they sat down. Everyone seems to do what Boaz says. I wonder why. Maybe he's just that kind of a man. And what happens then is that Boaz outlined the situation in verse 3. Then he said to the Redeemer, and this is quite important for understanding what exactly is going on in the background. Naomi, who has come back from the country of Moab, is selling the parcel of land that belongs to the belonged, sorry, to our relative Elimelech. Obviously, she needs to sell the lands because she needs money in order to live. So I thought I would tell you of it and say, buy it in the presence of those sitting here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if you will not, tell me that I may know that before there is no one besides you to redeem it and I come after you. And he said, I will redeem it. Oh, that doesn't look so good. Now, what's going on here? The background is the well-known law of Leviticus 25, which I'm sure you've come across before. It's the law of the redemption of property. This and not marriage is the first thing that Boaz draws attention to. We'll see why but that is the case in a moment. But the way it goes is if somebody becomes poor and needs to sell their land, you shouldn't treat land like you treat cows and camels and just sell it to whoever wants to buy it. Land matters in a way that other things don't in ancient Israel. It needs to stay within the wider clan, the wider family. And so if somebody's poor, like Naomi is, and they need to sell something, their nearest relative 
should buy it from them. And if they won't, then some other relative needs to buy it so that they get the money they need, but the land stays within the wider family and everyone keeps their inheritance, which is what the book of Joshua is all about, that every tribe should get their inheritance. So, in this case, Naomi's land is actually a very attractive proposition. Just think of the historical situation. For many years, there has been a famine in the land. And if there's a famine, land is worthless because you can work at it and work at it and work at it and it's not going to produce anything. So during the famine, all the stores of grain and everything else would have been depleted and people with land would just be sitting there no better off than anybody without land because the land is worthless. It can't be used to produce anything. But now for the first time in years, perhaps the first time in decades, the Lord has come to the aid of his people to give them food, which means rain has come, which means that land can now be used productively. Now, anybody you can get their hands on more land, even if it requires a bit of investment, is set to get themselves a great income because the rain will produce crops. And more than that, there's a huge backed up demand for goods because all the storehouses are empty. There's no supply. There's all demand. And in that situation, yes, you want to be a supplier. And so the man sees the dollar signs. The other redeemer sees the do dollar signs flashing before his eyes and thinks, yeah, this is my chance to get into farming big time and start making some serious cash. And so at the end of verse four, uh, he's, he can hardly contain his enthusiasm. Uh, in English, it says, and he said, I will redeem it. Four words. In Hebrew, it's two words. I'll redeem. It's pretty emphatic. So at this point, at this point, Boaz throws the perfectly timed curveball. And at this point, then his shrewdness is revealed. There is another law in the background, not just the redemption of property. Verse five. Then Boaz said, well, the day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you also acquire Ruth, the Moabite, the widow of the dead, in order to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance. This calls to mind the law of Deuteronomy 25, the law of leveret marriage, whereby if a man died, as Elimelech has died, his nearest unmarried relative is responsible to come and marry the widow of the dead man. Now, the purpose of this is to raise children on behalf of the dead man, a point that Boaz explicitly makes, uh, to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance. Now, it's possible, of course, that the man was aware of this. In fact, it seems quite likely that he was aware of that law if he's aware of the redemption of land law. But if he was aware of it, he clearly thought that Naomi was the woman in view. Naomi would be the woman that he'd have to marry. And though that might not be what he'd wanted exactly, it wouldn't be too costly in financial terms. After all, she's somewhat older. She's not able to have children. And therefore, anything that he can make from the land doesn't actually get passed to Elimelech's offspring. The offspring would legally be his. He can keep it all for himself. It's just win, 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 win situation. But Boaz rejects this. No, no, no. He says in another interpretation of the law, an interpretation that's in keeping with the spirit of the law. No, 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 no. If you acquire the land, you also acquire Ruth the Moabite, the widow of the dead, in order to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance. It seems that what Boaz is insisting on is that the law should be interpreted in keeping with its spirit, which is quite interesting, actually, for thinking about how we should interpret the law generally. We'll come back to that another day. The point here, of course, is that you really ought to marry Ruth, not Naomi, because she will be able to have children. Those children could then inherit the produce of the land that you, the Redeemer, had worked on for your whole life. And then the, the dead man would have... Um, uh, land and inheritance to pass on to his offspring, even though he was deceased. Now, this totally changes the economics of the situation. The Redeemer looks at this prospect now and sees, well, I've got to make a big outlay uh, to buy the land, and then I've got to invest in it to make it productive. Then I, my wife, Ruth, is going to have children, 
which is a lot more outlay, a lot more expense, college fees and all that sort of thing, like every parent knows. But then here's the killer. The children won't even legally be my children. They'll be Elimelech's children or they'll be Ruth's children or something, but they're not going to be mine. The fortune that I make won't stay in my family. I'm going to have to make a huge investment in another man's inheritance, not my own. And so what does he do? Verse 6. Then the Redeemer said, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I impair my own inheritance. He's just blown his cover entirely. Take my right of redemption yourself. I cannot redeem it. You see what Boaz has done? First, he's secured legally the right to marry Ruth. That's important enough. But secondly, He's done so in such a way that the true motives of the other Redeemer have now been revealed. After all, when it was just land we were talking about, he's happy to keep the law and to be the man who redeems. But as soon as it starts to cost him anything, it becomes more problematic and he refuses. So that if ever he should try to make a claim in the future to the land, or even perish the thought to the bride... Bowers will be able to recall this court case and say, no, 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 no. You had your chance and we all know why you declined it. You wanted the land. You didn't really want to take care of the young lady. And so the result is that everybody knows that Boaz is the one who is doing this for the right reasons. To care for Ruth, to care for Naomi. And it is his shrewdness which has brought that to public notice. We might add that it is his sacrifice which has made it possible. Here, after all, is a man who will give his life, in the sense of his life's work, to raise up another man's inheritance. Somebody who's truly worthy to be known as a redeemer. The Lord bless you, and I hope very much to see you soon. Bye for now.